All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Sarah Dash. I'm president and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy. And for those who may not be familiar with us, we are a nonpartisan organization dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. And uh, we're, we're delighted that you're here. And hello as well to those who might not be in the room but might be following us on Twitter at All Health Live. So we're here today to examine quality measurement for people with complex care needs and the important implications of quality measurement for related work on, on policy issues such as Medicare, Medicaid, and delivery system reform. Our goal is to better understand the essential attributes of person-centered care and how to translate these into quality measurement and real-time practice. And before we begin, I would like to thank the SCAN Foundation for making this briefing possible, um, as well as to the Valerie Wilbur Health Policy Fellowship Fund for additional support. We are really lucky to have an excellent panel here with us today. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists now. Um, all the way to um, my right, to your left, um, Roanne Cheney is Executive Director of the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. Her expertise is in long-term care, community integration, and meaningful consumer involvement. The patient perspective is important to everything we do here at the Alliance, but it's particularly critical for today's discussion on person-centered care. So thank you, Rowan, for being here. Um, next, Bruce Chernoff uh, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the SCAN Foundation, whose mission is to advance a coordinated and easily navigated system of high-quality services for older adults that preserve dignity and independence. Uh, to my, immediately to my right, Erin Giovanetti is a senior research scientist at the National Committee for Quality Assurance, NCQA. Her work focuses on developing healthcare performance measures for older adults and vulnerable populations. Um, John Bernat is senior director of quality measurement at the National Quality Forum. Dr. Bernat is also a part-time uh, practicing family physician at Wake Forest Baptist Peace Haven Family Medicine Clinic in Winston-Salem. Winston I almost got it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, and finally, Nellie Ganesan is a senior director at Avalier, where she advises clients on the implications of quality-related healthcare policies including public and private quality reporting programs, value-based care, and payment and delivery models. So um, we're gonna um, go ahead and start with Bruce Chernoff. Terrific. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to see all of you today. It, for those of you who are watching um, on the screen, our room is full, which we just see as an incredibly positive sign about the value and importance of quality measurement. Let me just say quickly that the SCAN Foundation fundamentally believes that all older people should live with uh, dignity, choice, and independence. All those with functional limitations should live the same way. And our discussion today is really about where does quality go to help measure that beyond the way we measure today. The foundation has focused on developing what we consider an essential, a set of essential attributes for measuring quality from a person's perspective. And that was developed through a consensus process, and I really want to acknowledge all the folks uh, on the screen and their organizations who came together to, to, to wrestle with the tough issue of how do you think about quality from a person's perspective, and how do we begin to do that in a way that can be measured, and the systems can be held accountable in the long run for the person's perspective, not just for the technical quality of care. When we look at the essential attributes, there are really four. Um, and, and these are meant to, to really complement the technical quality measures which we have today and continue to develop and refine. So the idea that we um, build a plan of care that is based on people's needs and goals, that those goals, those needs and goals are incorporated in a compassionate way into that plan of care and that there is a cohesive and easy, na easily navigable system that actually can work with, with the individual, their circle of caregivers, their family, to achieve that plan of care, and that ultimately that the plan is revisited on a regular basis, it is informed by experience, and that it, it's kind of a virtuous cycle, that, that quality, um, that experience drives the next generation of quality as people's needs are addressed and met. 
ultimately, this is hard. Um, we live in an environment. <laughs> I'm no longer thirsty. <laughs> um, ultimately, we live in an environment where, where um, form follows funding in healthcare, not the other way around. And so how we measure quality and then how quality is tied to how we evaluate systems, how we set minimum bars, do you meet the requirements to be a contracted provider or to be part of this program, and how we set maximum bars, how we acknowledge um, outside success. These are difficult questions, but the, these essential attributes and the work of the uh, group that came together to develop them, I think is a great foundation. I want to end by just thanking the Alliance for Health Reform for, for um, this event, but also all your leadership in this space. Thank you. Um, so next we will um, turn to Rowan Cheney um, to talk about person-centered accountable health. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you. I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of history of what I would call the person-centered planning and process. In Michigan, we established person-centered planning in our mental health code statute that applied to, in the 80s, mm -hmm. that applied to both people with developmental disabilities and people with mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, we followed that in the early 2000s by applying mm -hmm. and requiring person-centered planning to be used mm -hmm. in our uh, aging and disability waiver for home and community-based services. And most recently, Michigan has a dual demonstration under the Affordable Care Act, integrating Medicare and Medicare payment. Mm -hmm. And when we established that, advocates demanded in Michigan that that process include first center planning. So the first time first center planning went from not just a, an, a home and community-based services process, mm -hmm. but something that also applies in general health. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of argument about that, but uh, mm -hmm. it has happened, and I'll tell you in a mm -hmm. minute or so some examples of its positive impact. Um, mm -hmm. There is a, a lot of different definitions. CMS has one. State of Michigan has one. I'm sure there's other ones out there mm -hmm. that have been used in European countries and other states. Mm -hmm. But there's common themes that I've listed on this slide. And there's two that I forgot to put on there that I want to emphasize. And one is the whole process presumes a person comp competence unless there's hard evidence that competence is not there. Mm -hmm. I know all of you may be aware that people with disabilities and often aging people are sometimes presumed not to have competence when clearly they are very competent. So that's part of why that's in our code. And the other one is that behavior issues should first be interpreted in a form, as a form of communication. Often people who are nonverbal, whether they have dementia or they have a developmental disability or a physical disability that prevents them from communicating like you and I do, verbally. And sometimes they, in order to get people's attention or communicate that they don't like something, they have to use extreme means to get people to see that. And I have a lot of examples of that that I don't have time to present. Um, but they exist. It's also a process that we say you have to look beyond mm -hmm. purely clinical issues of your physical and mental well-being mm -hmm. and look at a person's environment. So you get to the social determinants of health and analyzing what's going on in a person's life. I'm going to use one example for myself when person-centered planning was not in process and people were not looking at me as a competent person to assess my own abilities. A few years ago, I did something really stupid and fell out of my wheelchair and broke both my legs. At the time, I was 
absolutely independent, lived my own life, didn't use, assist, lived by myself, didn't use assistance, but breaking my legs severely impacted that ability. So I was told by all the clinical folks in the hospital, I needed to go to ext an extended care facility. Said, no, I don't, I know how to manage. I know lots of people do manage, I, I can figure this out. They did not give me credibility on that. And it wasn't until I called a social worker colleague that I worked with at the rehab unit of that hospital I was in, and she came in and wrote in my chart that I was the associate director of a center for independent living, and I knew how to do this. And then she expressed to me in my room, I shouldn't have to do this. And she kind of swore and said, I have a lot to do. I shouldn't have to take my day, but I did it. And that's when I got credibility. And I said, yeah, you're right. You shouldn't have to do this. I shouldn't have had to call you. Mm -hmm. But that's how I got credibility, mm -hmm. is because I had a relationship with a professional in the system. Mm -hmm. What about all the other people that are not given credibility that should be? So that's the negative. You can always see it. It is very... I'll get to that part. It's very hard to measure, but you know when it's present and when it's, when it's not. Uh, as we've moved into practicing this in primary care through the health plans and the demonstration in Michigan, one of the medical directors was telling me about a situation they had with an older woman who had inadvertently gotten her home-delivered meals canceled, it was in error, but she had called them when she had no food in the house. And they clicked their system in and got this woman some food for the weekend, it was Friday, of course. And he said to me, I was very concerned about this woman taking her medication, mm -hmm. her diabetes medication, and all these other medications she was on. Mm -hmm at the right time and the right dosage. But he said, how could she do that when she has no food in the house? How could she focus on the right medications when she has no food in the house? And I thought, oh, the medical system is getting it. That you've got to look beyond the person's body and look at what's going on in their life. So that is very difficult to measure, and how do we do that? Um, we, I've amassed a lot of anecdotes of when a person's received person-centered services, care, whatever we want to call it. And there is a former director of our behavioral health system in Michigan says, yeah, I have a lot of anecdotes, lots of anecdotes of this system working and this process working. He said, like you, I always get dismissed because they're anecdotes. And he said to me, I love this quote, how many anecdotes make data and evidence? How many do we have to have? Um, some people are concerned that if we establish minimum sets, you're not really getting at the process the whole process and doing it right and really understanding what's going on with individuals. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a challenge. We've been challenged by it in Michigan. There's now a person that's gonna devote more time to try and how do we make sure the system's doing this. It's important to do, but we haven't hit on the, the right formula yet. I think it's very, doing authentic person-centered planning, and there's an article in your packet, very important to, do, to healthcare. It's a process that can, can be transformative to the person, mm -hmm. and also give staff a really rewarding experience when it works well. And is it cost-effective? We believe it is, but we don't have a lot of data about that. 
So thank you. Thank you. Ryan, if I could ask you a quick mm -hmm. follow-up question before we okay. move, move to, um, <clears throat> to Aaron's presentation. Thank you so much for your presentation. So you mentioned this is part of Michigan's code now in terms of the requirement to do person-centered planning. Who is actually responsible for making sure that that happens? And maybe it's... Well, yeah, that's, it's a good question because our state did contract exclusively with our county community mental health boards and that responsibility was contracted to them. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to another, uh, they've been moving to another managed care system. They're talking about integrating mm -hmm. behavioral health with physical health. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big questions is who's gonna be responsible for this? But it's the one that advocates are united on, somebody has to be. It's not totally no. Mm -hmm. Right now, ultimately, it, it, mm -hmm. because it's in code, everybody is. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> and particularly the mental health system. I have qualified faith, yes. <laughs> I have seen a good, uh, being a person that was involved in training our new integrated care systems. I have seen at the care coordination level, which is one I think is really important mm -hmm. to make sure it happens. I've seen a lot of good reception to it. Thank you so much. And uh, that's a great question. And the question of kind of how we take what's important to people, how we mm -hmm. measure it, and then how we, uh, John and, and Nellie are going <laughs> to talk a little more about how we actually translate that into real life and what accountability for all of that really means. Right. Um, so, so thank you for, for shedding light on that for us. Um, and, then, uh, and then we will get to, um, after the presentations, and an audience Q&A. So, um, and as you were thinking of questions, I'll just quickly mention it now. We have green cards on the table, so feel free to jot questions down as you're, as you're thinking. Um, thank you. So next, we'll move to Erin Giovanetti. Thanks, Erin. And if you could just pass the clicker down so Erin can advance her slides. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you all for uh, uh, inviting me to speak here and for you guys for attending during your lunch break to uh, listen to us talk about this. Um, I'm going to talk about how we actually would measure whether or not that, you know, the person-centered care that Roanne was speaking about and, and the attributes that Bruce was speaking about, how do we actually rubber hits the road measure whether or not those are being um, implemented. Um, and I'm going to talk about a project where that's been funded by the SCAN Foundation and the Hartford Foundation. Um, so in quality measurement, the way we tend to do things is we pick a population and we measure something. We measure the same thing across an entire population. And the challenge with this when you think about a complex population is that you're really dealing with a very heterogeneous population. And measuring the same thing in every person may not get you to the point of measuring what matters most. So we actually, um, under this grant, went out and we talked to people. We did focus groups across the country. And this is um, just focused on older adults that have a level of disability. But I think this could apply to any population. And we asked them, what matters most to you? What do you want to get out of health care? And some people talked about health and quality of life goals. Um, they talked about managing symptoms, stop falling as much, increase mobility. They talked about values that were important to them, like having privacy, choosing who cares for me in my home. They talked about care preferences, not so much about the outcomes, but how they wanted their care to be delivered. I want to stay out of the hospital. I want to get my doctors to talk to each other. And they also talked about goals they may have for their family and friends caregivers that are helping them. I want to help my caregiver to be less burdened. So when you think about all of these things, we would not want to develop one measure for each one of these things that's up there because we know that there are already too many measures and that not all of these things are going to be important in front of everybody. So how do we develop a system that actually measures these individualized outcomes? And so this brings us to person-driven outcomes, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about, which um, I feel are measuring both attribute one and attribute two from the, the um, essential attributes. And they're essentially individualized outcomes identified by the patient or the caregiver um, as important. So it's what they're telling you is what's most important to me right now at this given time. 
And I think a really important thing about these outcomes is we want them to be useful not just for quality measurement. We don't want them to be just things you're doing for quality measurement, but actually outcomes that are informative for care planning, something that are using this information is helping you to provide better care. So uh, we developed a process for actually collecting person-driven outcomes. And it starts by eliciting what's most important to someone. So uh, I started off before this project doing a lot of work looking across different records. And all of these organizations said, we do goals. We do person-centered goals. Everybody says, we do person-centered goals. And when you look at what the actual person-centered goals are that are documented, there are good goals. And there are some bad goals. Um, there are some organizations where goals are auto-generated from a risk assessment. And it auto-generates, well, your goal is to get your hemoglobin A1C under control. Um, they're not exactly person-centered goals. And so we need to really understand the process to how do you get to goals that are truly what someone wants. So we developed a goal inventory, and I'm sure this is probably too small for you to read, but using that input from the focus group, we developed these goals that is a discussion tool that you can use between an individual and the clinician that's working with them to say, what's most important to you right now? Is it around your health care? Is it around your physical activity? Is it around choice and control? Is it around things in your community? Once you have a goal, we need to know how are we going to measure or whether or not you're achieving this goal. So we did two different methods for that. The first method is called goal attainment scaling. This is not something new. We didn't invent this. This has actually been used pretty extensively in rehabilitation medicine, where you lay out a goal along a scale of what you would expect, what your expected outcome is, what you want to get to. Um, so for this individual, the expected outcome is to resume driving in six weeks and fly to California to visit family for the holiday. That was their goal. Then you lay out what it would be like to do even better than that goal. So what would it be like to do better than you're expected? So to resume driving in four weeks and fly to California in time for Thanksgiving. And what would it look like to be less than expected? Uh, to have complications from surgery and to not drive for at least three months and not make it to California for the holidays. And so once you've laid this out along the scale, the actual process of discussing this with somebody and helping them to talk through what it means to actually meet this goal gives you a measurable scale that you can use to look at goal achievement. So this works for some people when they've got a very specific goal, when they know exactly what they want. But some people don't always have a very specific goal. They have something like, I want to be in less pain. I want to feel happier. So here's where we have another method, which we call prioritized person-reported outcome measures, um, just because we like to throw a lot of words into our definitions. So here, we took all of those goals that we had in our goal inventory, and we matched them to where there are existing standardized tools for measuring those outcomes. So when you think about the goals around depression, anxiety, sleep, pain, there's standardized tools for measuring those things. And we put them in a bank. Now, if we were to ask somebody all of these questions, you have about a 300-item survey that no one is going to fill out. So instead of asking a 300-item survey, we say, well, why don't you just match the PROM, or the person-reported outcome measure, with the individual? So here you have two individuals, Mr. T. His goal is he's just got too many medications. He can't keep track of them all. Everything is just really difficult. He wants, he's going to use a healthcare test difficulty scale that's going to uh, measure how much difficulty is he having with his um, healthcare tasks. And he wants that to decrease. Mrs. S, what she really wants is she really wants to be able to get more of the services and supports in her community. She needs to get connected to community resources. So we're going to use an access to services and support scale for her. Now, each individual has a different scale that they're using, a different uh, questionnaire. But at the population level, we can know whether or not the population is achieving their goals of in either improvement or maintain on that particular person reported outcome measure. So I know this sounds really complicated, like how would you actually get clinicians to do this, which is the first thing I thought when we were coming up with this. Like, this is all great in theory, but come on, we've got a five-minute doctor's visit. No way this is going to fit in. Um, so we did this in uh, seven different organizations. Um, and uh, we got them to implement this. And we, this is some of what we actually came out of the data. So these are the types of outcomes that we saw when they actually sat down with someone and prioritized what's the thing you want to work on most in the next three months. We see these outcomes that are all over the place from healthcare utilization to physical, psychosocial, independence, travel and vacation, caregiver goals. They're really all over the place. 
And then in the 186 patients we had in this, we actually followed, well, how many achieved their goals? So the first thing we wanted to know was, how are you doing and actually following up on the goal? And what we saw that was that across both the methods, the goal attainment scaling and the PROM, about 87% of people had a follow-up on their goal, which is actually really good in terms of engagement. And about 60% achieved the goal. Um, and here's just a, a, a quotation from one of our participants. Um, you know, you can tell somebody what to do, but I think you convey better things when you give people options to do, find out what they like. And one thing I will note about this is that 60% of people met their goal, but when we talked to people who didn't meet their goal, they weren't dissatisfied with their care. In fact, when they talked about this, they felt that not meeting their goal was actually really informative to them about what they could do to help meet their goal in the future. And so this process is really the thing that engaged people in their care. And so I'll just close with a few different, a couple different quotations from the people that we engaged with this. One from a, 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 a pilot participant, I found in doing some of these things that we put down, there's a strength in me. People were far more engaged in their care when they were doing this. And then from one of our nurse case managers, all of a sudden they were totally engaged in healthcare and that was new for a lot of them. So I thought that was really cool. Thank you so much, Erin. And um, this maybe brings to mind a, a little bit of a follow-up question. You know, we hear a lot about patient engagement and patient satisfaction. Um, and interestingly, it sounds like from what you're saying that when you engage the patient, the, the, the people more in their care, they were that, therefore more satisfied with their care. Is that fair uh, to say? Definitely. I think that for a lot of these people, engaging them in these very specific, detailed conversations about their goals did engage them more in their health care and made them more satisfied with the care that they were getting from their Thank care you. manager. And if I could ask one other kind of clarifying question, mm -hmm. you mentioned the seven organizations. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about the types of organizations mm -hmm. that you worked with? So we had three health uh, plan complex case management programs, two home-based primary care programs, um, one patient-centered medical home. Uh, have I gotten to seven yet? There was another complex care management program in there. So. Thank you. Great. We will now turn to Dr. John Bernat from the National Quality Forum. Well, well Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for having me. I really want to thank both the Alliance and the SCAN Foundation. Uh, we've had the privilege to work with the SCAN Foundation, and some of what I'm going to talk to you about is taking those ideas and work that we've done. Um, I'm going to start, though, with how do you build measures or set a foundation to build measures around the patient voice? So a lot of what Aaron has already said, it's going to converge into the same themes that we have, but we're really trying to set a platform that is something that we can use to help facilitate measurement in this field. So I'll start just with our, our very generic, this goes with along with Aaron's, but for us a patient reported outcome is when a patient gives a, some report of their health status to us that is not interpreted by a physician or anyone else. So they're actually telling us something about their health status. That information, and we saw, we heard a little bit about anecdotes, that gives us the ability to start taking these anecdotes and making these responses into data points. And so we begin to move into the measurement field in, in a very systematic way there. And, and then the measures, they're just, they're quantifications of these responses. One of the ways that we've been trying to facilitate that is we have, uh, a group called the NQF uh, Measure Incubator. And what we're doing in there is we conduct strategy sessions and look for ways, meaningful ways, to, to bring the patient voice out uh, in the field of measurement. We try to do this very early on, before the measures are already baked, so that we have the right people around the table. These are multi-stakeholder, multiple perspectives, patients, hospitals, clinicians that are sitting around and giving input onto these measures before they're made so that they can come out with the best, the best success at the end. And, and we've done this over some really prolific topics. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which you know is COPD, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. I, I would suspect if you took a moment, you know a family member or a friend that has one of these. These are chronic diseases. They're real, and they affect lives for, for not just a day or two, but for years and years and years. And, and so the goal of what we're looking for is to facilitate how do we measure this, and how do we get 
to the point where we incorporate the patient's voice. So the patient wants to live the life the patient wants to live, and that's extremely important to us, and, and we want to make sure that's being heard. And, and in fact, as a clinician, it's, it's almost... Uh, it takes me back a little bit that some of the things that we do sometimes really actually impedes the livelihood of a patient um, because we're following the care plan and not listening to what the patient's priorities are. And so these measures help us get to that point. Um, I'll give you an example of this in, in action. We did a recent project with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and patients like me where we got very, very early input from patients as to what was important to them when they're being uh, treated by their physicians. And unlike what we are always taught in medical school and what we are currently measuring, which is how, what's the longevity? How do I prolong life? Or even to manage pain, that was not it. It was, can you help me with my fatigue? I want to do my daily life. I want to be involved in the community, and you need to help find a way to track that. It, simply put, the patients are sick and tired of being tired, and, and that's what we need to focus on as physicians. And I definitely take this, take this to heart to try to make sure we're incorporating this. Are we doing anything that is going to take them away from their goals here? And this really sets up well for a place where we can get patient reported outcomes and, and get patients involved in the quality of their care. So, so that's on the measurement side, what we've, what we've done there. But beyond measurement, um, we do work with our members. We're a membership organization. We have a lot of different members uh, across the healthcare spectrum, and they help us out by, by coming to the table for these things. And one of the things we've had them do is actually sit down and help us make practical, actionable guides, playbooks for clinicians or for healthcare organizations. Now, uh, one of such things is, is we have an action brief on shared decision making. And in this brief, it actually gives guidance to a clinician as to how do you facilitate those conversations. These are not easy, and if you've been part of that, which I suspect you have, you know these are sensitive discussions already around the patient's livelihood. Um, trying to preserve the dignity and trying to remain patient-centered can be difficult, uh, especially the way some of us have been trained historically. So it gives us a chance to reflect. It gives us some guidelines, some discussion points, and helps us frame uh, our, our encounters with our patients and making sure, again, what that patient wants is at the center and that we are very careful to make sure that our clinical decisions don't affect their livelihood in a negative way. So the action brief, which is actually included in your packet in, in the full length, if you look, it relates right back to these measures that we talked about with the work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Those things that we are learning from the patients are the things that we're trying to work into a guide and work into these, this com combination of both measurement and guidance here. So um, try and be sensitive to si time, but in closing, I, I do want to say there are a lot of great projects in this area. And, and as you hear, we're all working towards really, really the right goals. It's a immature field that, that is growing right now, and that's why we're all here today. But I mean, I really believe collectively uh, as a community, this work is go what's going to ensure that the patient's voice is heard and incorporated into these decisions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And so if I could just ask, I mean, it seems like, you know, really trying to incorporate the, the person's voice into the what is measured in terms of quality, it really represents, seems to represent kind of a sea change in how we think about what quality of care really is. I wonder if you could comment on that. And also, as a practicing physician, if you could talk about um, how, how does that change or how might it change um, the way, you know, that, that healthcare is practiced? We hear a lot about you know, the, the concerns about too much quality measurement, too much um, burden. Um, can, you, can you speak to that a little bit in terms of what this change might mean for daily um, clinical practice? Absolutely. And, and I will start by saying I completely acknowledge, and your, your question is spot on. I mentioned we're immature in this field, and by immature I mean that we are really good at measuring processes and things that are done, that technical medicine we're good at. But trying to incorporate this is something that we're still not there yet. And, and I do think we're in a learning phase of how to incorporate this. And on the provider side of this, it's going to 
be difficult for some individuals, I believe, until this be begins to fit in within the care we deliver. Uh, for example, if it becomes yet another thing, another box to check while still being checking the boxes for the technical medicine, this could be something that could add burden. And so I think the best way is gonna be whenever we can incorporate this into the way that we, we assess clinicians, uh, both in terms of their performance and, and potentially even so far at some point, at some point into um, the, the way that performance-based uh, payment models are, are done. So I, I just don't, I don't think we're quite ready, but I think w if we can integrate it into our daily workflow will be the best chance of us getting success on the front lines. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll now move on to uh, the final presentation for this panel. And um, you know we hear a lot about um, not only quality of care, but also value-based care and the move fr from volume to value or from fee-for-service to, to value-based care. It's become sort of a mantra. Um, but, but I'm here to help us better answer the question of what uh, value-based care really means um, from a person perspective. Um, we have Nellie um, Ganison from Avalier. Thanks. Oh, sorry, not using my head today, which is not helpful. Uh, I, I want to thank SCAN and the Alliance for, for having us. I think this is a great discussion. I get excited when I see this many people who are maybe interested in uh, quality measurement and patient reported outcomes and kind of how we think about value-based care. So hopefully you'll find this discussion helpful. Um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about also sort of how the different aspects that we've talked about align with the policy environment. Um, I think that that's probably where a majority of you are coming from. So um, hopefully some of these um, terms that I'll use will, will make sense to you. But um, really quickly, I'm going to just talk at a very high level as to what Avalier Health is because it doesn't come off from the name of the organization as to what they may do. Also, it'll, I think, help shape some of the comments that I'm making as well. Uh, we are an advisory services organization sort of focused um, on policy as well as implementation. So um, although I'll be talking a little bit about person-centered care and, and measurement and value-based care today, that's just one aspect of what the organization does. We also focus on um, helping a variety of our clients that include health plans and physician groups, um, pharmaceutical manufacturers, and medical device companies sort of prepare for different changes um, as it relates to healthcare. So a lot of sort of aspects of policy and legislation that you may be tracking, we are doing the same thing and thinking about sort of what the long-term either payment impact or also how an organization would change kind of their internal strategy as it relates to what's happening externally. Um, so that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. And I think, you know, one thing that I'll say before I get started is, you know, we're talking a lot about person-centered accountable care today. And a lot of my um, remarks will kind of be linked back to the quality measure environment, which um, all of us are linked to. And I think that that's a piece that, you know, sort of falls within all the different pieces of legislation and all the different policy pieces that um, folks are tracking everything from, you know, if we look at um, sort of how the exchanges are, are how folks are in in the exchanges as we think about Medicare Advantage and um, as we think about how people start to kind of choose their plans, a lot of that comes down to quality. Um, historically, as these folks have mentioned, you know, we've focused on this idea of process measures and there's been a lot of ask to move towards outcome measures, but measuring those types of things isn't always so easy. So then if we take outcome measures and then, you know, funnel it down to patient reported or patient-centered outcomes, that there's a lot of challenges there in collecting that data as well. Uh, so I'm just going to take a step back, um, a couple steps back, um, for, for folks that sort of maybe want to get a grassroots understanding of, of sort of why quality is important. And I know we've talked a little bit about that here, but um, in 2015, Health and Human Services had set out goals to basically say that they wanted to have these goals to mitigate fee-for-service payments with what's happening in the value-based world. Um, at that time, sort of the goal wasn't fully defined as in terms of what that meeting that goal would look like. They had, HHS had noted in 2016 that the, those goals had been met, but maybe the definition of how they were sort of thinking about alternative payment models and what was being captured in those alternative payment models um, wasn't exactly what they were looking for. So for those of you that are sort of tracking everything that's happening on the macro side and, 
advanced alternative payment models, you know that there's been a lot of new models that have been added um, that have sort of more upside risk. And so I think HHS is still moving towards achieving those goals, and you still have a lot of clinicians that are, um, you know, aiming to enroll in those programs. And that's when we start to think about sort of the idea of quality measures in those programs and uh, what clinicians can do to meet those quality measures. And sort of taking that same piece, um, the other thing, you know, I know we had heard earlier that the definition of person-centered care sort of means different things to different people. And I think the idea of value and quality also really means different things to different people as well. So, you know, on this slide, we have patients and providers and payers and life science companies. I think, you know, overarching what it means to everybody is this idea of getting sort of the right care at the right time across the different spectrum. But what we've noticed is sort of in the development of, of quality measures where we started out with process measures, you know, in some cases efficiency and structure measures, and moved a little bit towards outcome measures, that idea of measuring sort of what is most important to the patient I think is relevant for all, all of these um, different stakeholders, but maybe how they look at measuring those pieces of care isn't always um, aligned. Actually, just due to time, I'm going to skip over this slide because I want to focus towards the end here. Um, you know, and, and this kind of goes back to a little bit providing examples of what we meant by what was historically noted as the measures that we had that maybe didn't necessarily look at person-centered accountable care. So things like, um, you know, whether, whether a patient received an immunization, whether they were enrolled in a smoking cessation program, um, whether they got their A1C checked. And I think, you know, what's interesting is this article was published in 2013, and I think that, you know, not that that was that long ago, but these same sort of pieces on the right-hand side of what future measures would look like. So addressing things like patient harm and addressing things like patient-centered care and a variety of patient-reported outcomes that measure things like functional status and quality of life and patient experience are um, still it's still very questionable in terms of um, the work that's being done to measure them. I know we've heard some great work in terms of um, modes and advances to get to those different pieces um, of, of data collection, but I think that there's still you know, some, some optimal challenges to do that. And there's you know, the one thing that I wanted to introduce and maybe spend a little bit of time here is there's a lot of work that's happening with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation in terms of rethinking about how they really capture aspects of patient-centered care. There was a recent um, request for information that was released where they're doing a redesign of what they're looking at in terms of how those models um, would be rolled out. And one of the key things that was noted is that they're reevaluating all the models that they have so that they actually address something like patient-centered care. And they provided a very, um, and I don't want to say a concrete definition, but a, a good definition on empowering um, patients and families to take ownership of their health and to ensure that patients have the flexibility to make these informed decisions. And you know, one piece above doing that is when you think about these models, they all have some element of quality measurement that needs to be included. So taking the work that's been discussed here um, and really advancing and growing those types of measures are kind of one of the only ways that a model like this can, can move forward. And so I think with the contributions of various stakeholders and different consensus building, um, you know, a model like this can be rolled out as long as there are those measures that exist that can be uh, that can be included. Um, and just to just to wrap up, I think you know we've talked a lot about this, so I don't want to re uh, refocus on this, but. The idea of having these patient-centered measures, I think, is not just a benefit to patients. It's a benefit to a variety of different stakeholders. Um, oftentimes, you know, in these discussions, one of the sort of key stakeholder groups that, that gets left out is, is sort of that idea of the caregiver. And I think that that's an important, um, that's an important individual to think about when you think of patient-centered measures as well. Great, thank you so much, Nellie. This is a fantastic set of comments. And let me ask you one kind of technical question, maybe for those um, who, who don't follow these issues quite as closely. If you could, you talked about process measures versus outcomes measures. And if you could maybe um, lend a little more color around that, can you, can you um, maybe go into a little more depth about what that means? Yeah, and I'm sure these folks on the panel probably can do it even better than I can, but I will take a stab at it. Um, so. A process measure is me measuring a very sort of standard processes of care. So I think 
an example that's oftentimes used is, you know, did a patient receive a flu vaccination or did they get their A1C check? So it's just looking at a sort of a very snippet in time where an outcome measure technically, and, and, and this gets a little bit challenging when you think about sort of all the variety of outcomes there, but a good sort of measure to, to think about with that is maybe a readmissions measure. So did, if a patient was a patient readmitted within 30 days of having um, a specific condition. Um, so it's looking at a long-term outcome versus that process measure, which is looking at a very sort of snippet of time. And maybe John can speak to that too, or? Oh, no, I, I think you answered it very well. So it's that, that snippet in time, did I do a checkbox, is the process. And, and some processes are very well linked to outcomes. So it's not to say that it's bad, but the outcome is that end result and, and uh, usually a little bit more uh, complicated as to the measure itself, as to how are we measuring this and, and beyond that and without getting too far down. How can you have, who's responsible for that one outcome, which may be a group of individuals? Thank you so much. So we've reached the, the Q&A portion, and um, some people have already started sending up green cards, which is fantastic. Um, so this is your chance now. If you have a question, you want to write it on a green card, um, someone from our staff will come um, pick it up. You may also wish to ask uh, your question live, and I can't really see them from where I'm standing, but there's two mics um, in the, in the um, aisles there. But let me, let me just kind of, um, while, while folks are getting their thoughts um, organized, let me kind of kick it off with this question, which is, can we just get to sort of what is the fundamental purpose of quality measurement? And, and maybe, um, maybe it's a little too philosophical, but like what's the ultimate goal? Is it the triple aim, sort of you know, better care, better um, health at lower cost? Is it, um, is it uh, related to payment? I mean, when we talk about value, oftentimes there's this question of something you get for your money. Um, you know, and, and, and what does that mean in terms of how we think about measuring quality? Yeah, I, I can um, I can start to answer that. It, it sort of addresses sort of some of the the, the aspects that I was intended to cover. Um, the overall value of quality measurement that is a very philosophical question. Um, you know, I think some people would say that it's in some cases being a little bit more transparent about the types of sort of processes that are taking place within between you know in in the purposes of what we're talking about today between the physician and the patient um, in some cases I think we can say that the purpose of quality measurement especially as we move towards value tends to be a little bit more linked to accountability um, and I think you know a third piece of that is really showcasing performance over time so you know I think a lot of people would argue that that is some of the issues with the process measures is you can't actually start to look at whether you are improving a patient a patient or an individual's care over time if you're just measuring a process and so that's why you know these discussions around more sort of increased value based purchasing programs and pay for performance programs are really starting to look at not just a you know a moment in time but over a period of time is a clinician improving sort of the type of care that they're delivering Great. Well, we have a couple of questions um, here uh, that, that get into sort of profession-specific or specialty-specific quality measures. Um, so, so there's a question about how, how um, we would advise those who want to develop meaningful quality measures for specialists. Um, and, and, a, and a related question that um, some professions, uh, like, like occupational therapy, already have um, specific evidence-based assessments for um, certain things, um, like social participation and health task difficulty. So the, the question is kind of, is there room for, um, for these kind of occupation-specific or specialty-specific measures um, in the kinds of frameworks that we're talking about, and, and how does that relate? Um. So I think, yes, there's definitely room for uh, specialty-specific measures. I think where we need to aim for is um, trying to have alignment and trying to have specialties work as a team to 
for what the individual needs. So when we think about if I was to take occupational therapy, you know, occupational therapy has their assessments. They look at healthcare test difficulty. They look at functional status, and those are really great things that they need to know. But they're not the only provider for that individual. That individual has a lot of other things going on. And so when I think about quality measurement, I try to think about everything that that individual has going on. What do they want to achieve out of that? And to, we think we still struggle with how do we hold individual providers accountable for what is a shared accountability for an individual and everything that's happening to them. And I think we still have work to do in terms of figuring out how we have a measurement system that works for individual providers, but also has a higher level of looking at what's happening for a whole person. And I, and I could speak to that a little bit from our philosophy, and, and it's probably already starting to sound like a broken record, but, but to us, starting this off is really getting the right stakeholders in a room before we go down this path. So how do we get the perspectives of different individuals in healthcare? And I would agree with what, what Aaron uh, has already said. I do think there is, there is room for us to look for, for more measures in this particular space. We don't want to explode measures, but this space does need more good measures. I also agree, though, with Aaron, when we start looking at outcomes, and, and some of these things around patients are outcomes, we really do need to look at what level of analysis. Is that a clinician can affect that, or is it the team? Which, as Aaron mentioned, if we're looking at teams, that takes the need to have less of these individual specialties, because it may be a team caring for a particular population or a particular condition, and not necessarily the occupational therapist or the orthopedic surgeon. So, so I do think we have room for this. I think we would want to have this done in a multi-stakeholder way. And uh, again, I do agree with everything that Aaron had mentioned. Yeah, I guess I would just add, um, as more of a as sort of an outsider looking in, but as a physician as well, is that the challenge I would lay out for those of you who who are thinking about this sort of the specialist question is, it's ultimately about what the person wants and needs. And I worry a lot about, I, I, and I completely agree with what both the other speakers have said, but I don't, if all we do is create more specialty measures, we did a better job with that hip, hip and that tooth and that this and that that, I mean, I would just ask all of us to close our eyes for one second and say, is that really what's important to me? And we all want technically good quality care, right? I, there isn't anybody on this panel who would disagree with that, and I doubt there's anybody in this room. But it's also, you know, is this the right decision for me? And given the trade-offs in my life, um, are we balancing the tools that are available with the goals that I have? So I think as we think about... Um, who are the stakeholders who are involved in the discussion and, and making sure that the voices of people are heard and that the values that we all keep for ourselves and our families are on balance with the technical, technical quality of care, that's really important. And the last thing, since neither of you sort of, you touched on the team, which I totally agree with, but put, would push further is, as a physician, I do think we can learn a lot from the medical disciplines that aren't being a doctor or being a nurse. And I think that understanding other disciplines that really do think even more about function and outcomes, um, the, the rehab specialties and whatnot, I think it would be very powerful. I think there's a, there's a lot of learning to be done here on behalf of, um, of people and families and patients when we're patients. So. Anyone else? So l let me kind of, there, there's a bit of a follow-up to that question, which is that, you know, person-centered care, um, the, the, the writer comments, is what all physicians strive to achieve. Um, but there's this question about kind of uh, physician, or I'll call it um, healthcare professional, you know, all of those who are providing care in the, in the clinical setting, kind of their satisfaction in this, this um, again, this challenge of are we creating too many boxes to check and sort of what the, what the goals are. And so if, 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 um, if folks could kind of comment on um, on that, and, and again, they note, and Aaron, as you noted, you know, 15 to 20 minute visits or, or less don't really necessarily provide enough time for, for these kinds of person-centered assessments. So in the real world, how does this play out? So I can say in our project that we did, um, 
we had of the seven sites, two of the sites had physicians doing this and the rest had a, a care management team, either nurses or social workers. One place even did it with community health workers. It worked far better when they had a team doing this than when it was the physician alone uh, responsible for it. I, uh, I apologize to the physicians on the panel and to those in the room. They were not very good at this. Um, they looked at people and said, I know what your problem is, I can solve it. Uh, as opposed to sitting there and asking people what they wanted. Um, so when I think about how this is gonna actually roll out, it is about a team and it's about having that support network of uh, nurses, social workers, and other disciplines that can help to support a, uh, a full team that includes the medical perspective as well as non-medical perspectives in terms of helping people to achieve these outcomes. So, of course, that measuring quality is important, but what about cost? And, um, you know, are we, does this necessarily mean um, measuring this kind of quality in the way we're talking about? Does it necessarily mean it costs more? Um, and and can, you, can you kind of get to addressing that question? So who's going to pay for it? So in the places that we were working in, these were, um, uh, how was it paid for? It was either health plans or other accountable entities that were at risk and wanted to find ways in the end to reduce high cost utilization, reduce hospitalization, reduce emergency department visits, and reduce placement in uh, nursing homes. Uh, do I think that we have not gotten to the point of proving that this is going to improve those outcomes? That's our next phase. But I can tell you that when I talked to people that were engaged in this, what they said was, I'm getting people to engage in discussions about their health in a way that I was not able to before. And in the end, if you want somebody to take care of their diabetes and to take their medication for their diabetes, and what they're saying to you is, I can't take my medication for my diabetes because I need to be putting all my money into my medical care for my cat right now because my cat is the most important thing in my life right now and I'm not gonna spend money on medication until that takes care of. It's far cheaper to help them take care of their cat than it is for them to end up in the emergency department. Thanks, and let me let me turn to Rowan. Um, you haven't um, chimed in in a little while. Is that do you find that to be true? Like when you ask people what's really important to them, is it in the end is that actually going to get us to a um, more efficient healthcare system? <laughs> Ran out of time, but I was going to give an example of a physician who took the time to ask somebody, because everybody always questions, how does this work with non-compliance? People just are non-compliant. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you ask them why. Mm -hmm. Do you ask them what's going on that's preventing them mm -hmm. from taking a medication or doing what they're supposed to do? And a local physician said he finally did that. You know, he's rushing around, and for months and months, this woman would not take this medication that was prescribed for her. Mm -hmm. And he went in and he said, I'm just going to take the time mm -hmm. and ask the woman, why, what, what is it that was preventing her from taking this medication? Mm -hmm. And she said, because her former doctor, who she loved, had told her never to take it. And then he, through discussing with her, he figured out why the former physician had not done that, mm -hmm. why it didn't apply anymore, was able to talk to her and have a lengthy discussion. Mm -hmm. But he firmly believed it was going to prevent them a lot more medical complications down the road mm -hmm. by taking the time to find out why. Um, so yes, I, th I think all of this with the, the cost, I think it is. I think we all, most of us believe it is cost effective, but we haven't proved it yet. And the one thing I guess I would add to this is, underlying that question is, are we paying for the right things now? So when right. you look at the amount of money we're driving into healthcare right now, if you look at the cost of an interaction, whether, and if you, all of you just think about your own experiences, the amount of time that you spend interacting in ways with the healthcare delivery system that aren't actually improving the quality of your life. So the amount of hassle or time it takes to make the appointment, the amount of time that you spend filling out all those lovely little checkbox forms in the waiting room, the amount of time that you spend waiting in the waiting room. Um, I don't know any other industry that loves waiting rooms as much as healthcare. I, um, and I raise this because each of those steps costs something. So we're actually spending a lot of money in healthcare now in ways that doesn't actually deliver on the promise of health. And so I do think the, the, these risk-bearing models, there is an opportunity to really 
rethink how we deliver care. So rather than dragging somebody all the way into the doctor's office to be told, this is how you take your medicine, maybe I just need to be able to talk to a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or somebody on the team who can help answer my question that doesn't involve all those interactions. So I, I think the cost is a really fair question, but I would just challenge us to ask, are we spending our dollars today to get the value we want? There's a question at the mic. Um, hi, my name is, is this on? Oh, hi, my name is Emmett Tarrant. I'm from Senator Whitehouse's office. I just wanted to thank the panelists for taking the time to discuss this important topic. Um, I have heard many of you discuss the wants and needs of patients. Uh, my question is, how does telehealth play a role in person-centered care? Also, what have your organizations done to improve and provide better access to telehealth services? Thank you. Thank you so much for your, the telehealth question. And actually, that was going to be one of my next questions. I'm kind of piggybacking on what Bruce was saying is maybe, is there another way to uh, um, address the, the, the interaction of people with their health care providers? And so there was an, also a green card question. And just to add to your question, sir, um, the question is kind of how does quality measurement then extend to the telehealth world? So. And I, I can take a, I can get this discussion going because actually this is an area where, where we at the National Quality Forum are really putting some energy and actually to your question just had a, a paper released uh, at the end of August specifically on telehealth being a challenging area in quality measurement. A and again, as, a, as someone who sees patients, there is a ton of promise in something like telehealth, increase in the access for patients to geographic access, specialist access is huge, but also taking the burden down for patients so that they're not having transportation problems, mobility problems, getting in and out of these waiting rooms. So there's a lot of promise. So what our, our project did was say, this area needs measurement and it doesn't have it. So it was a preliminary um, look at the field of telehealth and broke it down by different things such as, the access of care, did it improve it actually? What was the patient experience? And, and most importantly, what was the quality of the care delivered? Did the quality of care remotely or over some electronic format match the care that you would have received if you came in the office? So, so there's quite a bit and certainly afterwards, be happy to, to get you the full report and give you some information, but it's a great topic and I do think it absolutely gets at a person-centered approach where we can look at the whole person and try to perhaps pick off a few obstacles to care for those, those individuals. There was a question, just, um, I'll just, well, what were the basic uh, conclusions of the report on telehealth? Can you go into that? Yeah, I think the basic conclusion was that this, this level is needed, that these measures are really needed, and that's the next step. And it actually went so far as to propose a lot of concepts. It wasn't just high level, but within certain domains saying, let's get to the point where we can measure these so we can fully assess it. But overall, um, really understanding and endorsing the promise that it has to offer. Great. Thank you, and I'll ask John to make sure that to give me that link, and we'll make sure to put on the Alliance website at allhealthpolicy.org along with the other resources for, for this briefing. Um, great, well, thank you. Can you I, all are a phenomenally engaged crowd, I have to say. Um, oh, Rowan, you have I a- I want to make uh, one comment about telehealth because I think it is very helpful to people, especially on follow-up, but again, it needs to be used in a person-centered manner because some people are not, don't appreciate, they don't want to be talked to somebody on the phone. Mm -hmm. Other people love it, so you have to deliver it in a person-centered way and not rely on it to be the solution to cutting costs. Mm -hmm. We just went through in Michigan a huge battle mm -hmm. with the dual demonstrations about mm -hmm. seeing someone brand new. Can you do a complete assessment over the phone? And we advocated you cannot. But there is so much that you're going to miss of that person's environment. You can pick up things in communication with their family if their family's with them. You miss all the nonverbals. There's, and our state decides that you have to do it in person. The initial appointments have to be in person. So I don't think that's a... Yes, it's greater. Yes, no, it's not. It is going to depend on the person. Thank you. Thank you. 
Let me ask a question that's, sorry, it's not on the card, but it just, it touches on a conversation we were having earlier, which um, goes to, and it does go to some of this um, high touch, high tech kind of conversation mm -hmm. that we're having, um, which is, what about, you know, we have a big country, rural areas, urban areas, very different kind of practice settings. Um, can, can our panelists talk about how this conversation plays out or might play out in different kinds of geographic settings? Yeah, and, and I can take the, a stab at starting this also. And, and this is a real a challenge. Getting measurement done in, in a rural area is challenging. For, we didn't go into some of the um, nuts and bolts of measurement, but, but needless to say, if you have a small population, it's difficult to measure the getting any valid validity in there to say if, it's, if you only had one patient that met a condition, it's a zero or 100%. That's not a fair assessment of one's performance. And so consequently, rural providers in those in areas with small numbers are often excluded from a lot of incentive programs. And we did look at this particular issue in rural health and really tried to, to give recommendations to the field on how to include rural providers in these. I, I will go so far as to say, I think this is an area where we could because a patient voice, regardless of whether you're rural or whether you're urban or you have large numbers or small numbers, uh, can be important if it's, if it's done the right way. So I do think this is a, it's a good area. It could be one of those cross-cutting type of topics that wouldn't matter as much on the, the geographic location of the patients. Just to add to what John said, and he sort of made this point as well, from a policy perspective, that idea of sort of a low volume threshold, so clinicians that sort of see a, a smaller number of patients, they are excluded from a lot of those value-based purchasing programs. And I know that oftentimes those clinicians still want to collect some of that data on their patients really to track improvement, which I think is, you know, how a lot of these um, measures started. So even though it, that may, it might be challenging for them to report on certain measures given kind of the volume of patients or where they're located, a lot of them still have interest in, in collecting that information to showcase improvement. Okay, I want to get to a couple of questions that people have asked about kind of trade-offs of or possible trade-offs of um, sort of this idea of, of um, person-centered um, care or quality measures. And then I want to get to a set of questions around implementation, implementation at the health plan level, state level, um, and in federal programs. So, so the, the questions around, I, I guess what you could kind of call trade-offs is, is one person asks, how should providers balance times when patient goals might be at odds with a, a larger societal goal? And, and they raise the, the the um, example of opioids, where someone's idea of pain control might um, mean perhaps more opioids as opposed to um, something that um, you know maybe wouldn't um, contribute to the opioid crisis. Um, and then another person asks, um, how do you draw the line between patient-centered care where the patient can ask for what they want versus the physician using their expertise to say what they think is best for the patient's health. So can you all kind of address what I'm sure are questions that you've thought about um, extensively? Um, so the opioid uh, situation came up and actually one of, uh, two of the encounters I observed as part of the evaluation of what we did where somebody, this was uh, two different people, wanted opioids for pain and they were very frustrated that the provider was not giving them the opioids for pain. And I saw this work out in two different ways. One was that the provider spent a long time sitting down with the, in the individual and talking about a pain clinic and eventually got the person to agree that a pain clinic was the better approach than to go on an opioid. And the other where the provider said, okay, we'll talk about it next visit um, and pushed it off to the next one. Um, I don't think there's a right answer. There is always going to be difficult situations where someone is asking for something that may not be necessarily the right thing for them, for their health, for the people around them, um, or for society. And we as quality measure developers cannot come in and stick our nose in the middle of that uh, clinician-individual relationship. We have to rely on clinicians being able to uh, uh, use judgment to do the right thing in those situations. Um, but I don't think that our fear of trade-offs and those, those situations should keep us from doing this type of measurement. When we started this work, we heard a lot of people saying, this is going to not work because individuals are going to ask for unreasonable things. They're going to have unreasonable outcomes that they want to achieve. I want to cure my dementia. 
and we can't hold clinicians accountable for that. When we started doing it, that's not what happened. Actually, most of the time people were setting goals that clinicians said, this is too modest a goal. You could achieve more than this. So sometimes I think our fear of what we think is going to happen keeps us from moving forward in areas where we actually could make change. Thank you. Rowan, you look like you have something to say. I did have something to say because I thought part of the whole person process is also in offering people options is being very straight with the consequences that one option may bring that another one doesn't in terms of what happens if you follow one optional treatment. In working with a lot of people, um, I, I have found that sometimes providers are reluctant to tell people the negative consequences of their decisions, the potentials. And we generally kind of advocate, you gotta be straight with people about what's going on. Um, and actually in the opioid issue, we've looked at some data from our home and community-based services and there was very high pain indicators that people were experiencing a lot of pain who were on the waiver program. Mm -hmm. And the Consumer Quality Collaborative said, we wanna look at that, why is that? Well, it turned out that half the people who had been prescribed pain medication were not taking it because they didn't like the side effect, side effect of being groggy and not able to function or focus on the things in their life they wanted to focus on. And they, would, they were actually making a decision to experience more pain mm -hmm. than take those medications mm -hmm. that were causing that grogginess. So I, I think there's a lot of issues in that in terms of people getting the full information they need to make a decision mm -hmm. for themselves. I'll just add one more. We, I was happened to be at a conference just a, about a week ago, a primary care measurement conference, and the same issue came up. And one of the strategies, and this is maybe taking my NQF hat off a little bit and getting into a clinician, but one of the strategies that we had discussed there was, was really this concept of the co-development of goals. And if that step occurs, then we don't really run into the same problem because we would not co-develop a goal where you're getting 20 oxycodone in a day. That would not be a co-developed goal. So once we get that agreed upon co-developed goal, then these things can move forward. I also agree with Aaron that I think we don't have we have a lot of fears, and, and we put the fear first sometime that all of these things are gonna break down and what if, what if, what if, but I would suspect, and, and this is speculation though, that we saw this in process measures earlier, that there's no way you can, this isn't going to work, and then they work themselves out. So I think moving these measures forward is still the right thing to do. Are they ready for payment programs? Perhaps not yet, but I do think still we'll be learning a lot about how the patients are interpreting these and, and likely, in my opinion, will be pleasantly surprised at the results that we get from these types of measures. Thank you. So I wanna get to a whole series of questions we have about implementing these measures in terms of payment and, and other kind of alternative payment models, et cetera, but I wanna get to the question at the mic first. Thanks. Yes, hi. Is this working? I think it is. I, first, I just want to say how much I honor the work that all of you are doing. And as somebody with a background in public health from Harvard University, where I've done both research as well as practice related to a lot of the concepts that we're discussing today, um, some of my background is also related to psychology and sociological aspects of um, really related to the efficacy of care. And I just, I want to point out, and I wonder if speaking ahead, you know, thinking forward about how can we really do get the need for these measures really understood um, by the decision makers and just really as a country, with the country as a whole. When you look at the data of how mind and body are related and how a person's intrinsic motivation and just their feeling like they're invested in their care, we know that psychologically, as well as with their social environment, 
you know, it's so key to know, does somebody have somebody to take them to the doctor? Do they have somebody who can listen when they have a concern? You know, this gets into the caregiver, obviously, but also the broader social community. So there's a wealth of evidence that shows that if certain aspects of an individual are not there, you can give them all, or you can prescribe all the medication you want, but are they gonna take it? And will they take it when and how they need it? If somebody is depressed, anxious, or has a number of other things, I've worked with heart patients, and it, it really, at a high level, if somebody has psychological issues where their will to live, for example, is not there, I, the system is, is spending money and time to provide this care, but I, you know, it, if some of these things that attend to the person-centered care are not acknowledged at all, I, we have wasted a lot of money. And so I, I just wonder how, how familiar you are with some of this research, and I can't help but think that it would add a really strong case for exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you for the comment, and I think it goes to some of the questions we were talking about earlier with regard to patient um, engagement and, and motivation as opposed to kind of the, the this idea of compliance or adherence. Um, but that, that'll, I'll stop my editorializing and see if anyone wanted to comment. Uh, so thank you, I think you're entirely right. There is, there's a lot of evidence out there about patient engagement and how do we actually get people engaged in their care. Where I come in is saying, okay, we, we know what's right. Maybe there's evidence for it, maybe there's not. Maybe we just know it's right. How do we measure whether it's actually happening? Because we're not there in the room observing, and we're not listening to the conversation. So how do I know from what's being documented whether or not it's happening? And so that's where I think we struggle with still. Okay, we have we have some really great questions up here about implementing um, all the ideas we've talked about in, in kind of the, the payment programs, um, and uh, so let me um, let me kind of start, and I'll try to do my best to combine them so we can get as much uh, commentary as we can. Well, one question is: What are key issues or considerations uh, for health plans or states? that are hoping to tie person-centered outcomes to alternative payment models. And there's a related question about whether there are examples of uh, managed care plans, state governments, or health systems that are using quality measures to, to redesign um, coverage programs and uh, even go uh, um, into supporting patients outside of the medical setting. So um, I'll try to combine those two questions. What are the key issues or considerations for implementation? And then are there some good examples out there? I can, I can speak to that first. Um, there are, uh, so a lot of what is happening, um, at least on the alternative payment model side, from a managed care plan perspective, um, a lot, some of what they're doing is actually being adopted from what's happening with Medicare, and sometimes it goes vice versa. So I think sometimes when you, you know, with the initial rollout of what was the accountable care organization on the Medicare side, there were some lessons learned from plans in terms of how those measures were being adopted. I think, you know, historically speaking, uh, what plans do, sort of what the private plan market is doing in terms of the types of measures that they're including isn't necessarily necessarily made public, but they um, go about it in a couple different ways. One, they use a number of HEDIS measures um, to, to for their for their different alternative payment models. Two, they do sort of, especially um, on the patient reported outcome side, do build sort of homegrown measures that they may use internally. And then third, if there are measures that are being used in the Medicare program that aren't um, NCQA measures or developed by other entities, they do tend to um, adopt those measures. Um, to answer the second question, I think, um, there are a number of sort of good models to look at. I think the one that comes up a lot in these types of conversations um, is the alternative quality contract model with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Um, they have a, a good set of measures that are sort of publicly made available, and they have um, a number of different sort of measures that also uh, look at uh, not only patient-reported outcomes. I think the one that they use is um, called the PHQ-9 that assesses depression that I'm sure this whole panel is very familiar with. Um, and they, they've adopted, they're working on developing um, some additional measures to include in that um, value-based contract as well. Um, so I was recently at a health plan and they told me about their, their fair 
their health fair that they were having, and they said, the health fair is so we can get everyone to come in and they can get their HEDIS measures. And I said, what do you mean, get their HEDIS measures? And they said, so we can check off all those HEDIS measures we have to report on. So they were having people come in and get their eyes scanned and their hemoglobin A1C checked and their blood pressure checked. And they didn't think of this as we're doing this because we're getting all these preventive health things in. They thought of it as we're doing it to get all of our HEDIS measures checked, which is not the way HEDIS was ever intended to be used so that you would have a you know, fair just to meet all your HEDIS measures. Um, so it just every time I, talk, I hear about HEDIS measures being used to transform systems, I, I think about some of the limitations of our HEDIS measure set. Um, that being said, what do I think are the, great, the good, most exciting quality measures that are out there right now for doing some of this? Um, we are about to introduce a new set of HEDIS measures focused specifically on long-term services and supports um, that I think are starting to get at some of these more non-medical aspects around assessment and care planning that I think are going to be really great. There's also some really exciting work coming out of um, actually a recently endorsed um, measure of uh, Experience with home and community-based service providers, um, also getting at that type of patient-centered care of what are the, your actual experience with those people that are coming into your home on a regular basis to help you out. Um, another quality tool that I find very useful is um, the National Core Indicators, um, is another one. They have an aging and disability survey that um, looks at a state, also it's being used at a health plan level, looking at some of these outcomes, and it's a really well done survey. So those are my suggestions. Anyone else want to weigh in on, on that question? Great. Okay, so there's there's another question here, and um, there was a recent MedPAC recommendation that um, the MIPS program, which is part of, I'm going to use a lot of acronyms, so I'm sorry in the last 10 minutes of the briefing, but um, the MIPS program, which is part of the, the recent macro legislation, the whole quality payment program, how physicians are paid in, in, in Medicare, um, that 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 program should be eliminated and revised. And so the, the question for the panel, it's a little bit of an unfair, like, look in your crystal ball um, kind of a question. But the question is, what's the likelihood that HHS will follow that recommendation? Um, but perhaps um, you know, more to what you could speak to, what impact would that have, if any, on measuring patient-centric outcomes? So uh, from my experience of working on measures that uh, will be used in MIPS, if MIPS moves forward, I can't speak to whether or not it's going to move forward. Yeah. Probably it will. Uh, uh, but I can say one of the, the challenges we have is a bit of a, uh, a chicken and an egg thing of we can only measure what's currently being documented, but we want to measure things that aren't being documented. And so how do we get ourselves to a point where, so if I take, for example, measures around let's just take rheumatoid arthritis and wanting to have person-reported outcome measures in rheumatoid arthritis. In order to get a measure into MIPS, you have to go through a whole process of testing and QF endorsement, all of those sorts of things, except no one's collecting person-reported outcome measures on rheumatoid arthritis. So how do you test the measure then to get it into the program to then get it measured so that people start collecting the information? And so I think we have a lot to work through still in terms of using quality measures to drive system transformation when quality measures have to be based off of the practices that are going on now. Um, and I think we still have that challenge to overcome. Thank you. And there's there's one more question I want to try to fit in, which related to um, nursing home care. How do you see these elements being kind of incorporated into the the highly regulated world of nursing home care, if if you can get to that? Um, so one of the sites in our pilot actually did this in um, a nursing home setting. Um, I think that. Uh, the, the piece that we did around goals works perfectly well in a nursing home community setting because it's really about what do you want to achieve and it's person driven, it's decided by the person. Um, so I have hopefulness that this approach could actually be something used across any delivery system, any type of provider because it's based off of uh, what somebody wants at that individual time. Great, thank you. All right, we have about five minutes left in, in, in our briefing time. I, I want to thank those of you who have stayed with us. I'm going to ask kind of one final question of our panelists um, as, you, um, as you prepare to, um, to wrap up the briefing. We have blue evaluation forms. We appreciate if you could um, just fill those out before you, before you head out. But I want, to ask, I want to ask everyone if they could maybe spend a minute kind of talking about where do you see quality measurement going um, in the future? And um, 
how does that relate to the, the person-centered um, principles we've been talking about today? And I'll, I'll just, we'll just go down the line and start with Roran if that's, if I can put you on the spot to go first. <laughs> Let me remember to turn on my mic. Um, I would say some more, it's good to hear from this panel that I, and it is going where I think it's going more towards patient-centered outcomes. Mm -hmm patient reported outcomes. I, I hope that's where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we will get to more of what's important to the person themselves by doing that. There's a lot of work to do yet, though. <laughs> I guess I see us getting to a point where there's, um, it's a scale with two platforms. And so technical quality of care will always be really important. But that we're also going to get to a place where um, personal experiences and goals are also really important, so quality of life and quality of health, and that those are balanced against one another. And I, I think sort of extending on that for one sec, I would say that it, it gets to a place where I, I sense that there, there's a lot of fear in the healthcare delivery system about actually asking people's experience and their goals. And what the work of these really talented panelists shows is that you can actually ask these questions in, in ways that are important, that uh, people or patients actually underestimate what they can achieve, and by activating them, even if they don't achieve their goals, they actually may be more satisfied, that outcomes may be better. So to me, there's this real opportunity to sort of beat down the fear quotient and move to something that, in the long run, I actually think healthcare providers and delivery systems would find more rewarding. Um, I think the majority of our healthcare quality measures have focused on the largest population right now, which is generally healthy adults um, prevention. I think we're going to move much more towards more quality measures focused on very specific high need, high cost populations where we can um, actually start to move the needle on uh, uh, value. Yeah, I totally agree with exactly. Bruce said it. Um, marvelously that there's got to be a balance between this patient-centered approach and then the clinical indicators of quality that we're so used to be so used to using and I definitely think I see that going uh, I think outcomes in general are, are where we will move getting away from processes and trying to get the right responsibility or attribution level around outcomes and the other thing that hasn't um, been mentioned specifically is the impact of the social determinants of health disparities and equity on the measures I think will be a topic of discussion uh, certainly for the next couple of years to see how that all fits in to, the, to this big picture. I would agree with, with everything that's been said, and especially with what Aaron said around measures that are developed for sort of this high need, high cost population. I think that where we can start to see some real change is probably in that, in that area. And then the other thing I would just add is, you know, not that this was the question, but sort of what I hope is that the focus of measurement does, isn't always linked to payment. I know that that's kind of where we are today, but you know, the initial sort of reason why a lot of these measures were created was really to sort of improve outcomes. And with an overall focus on payment, I think we start to lose that. So hopefully that, that doesn't override the initial thought process. Well, thank you. And um, I would like to thank all of our panelists for lending their expertise. I'd like to thank all of you. I think. Honestly, this is like the most green cards I've gotten in any briefing in this entire year. So thank you uh, for being such an engaged audience. Um, we really appreciate you spending your Thursday afternoon with us. Thank you to the SCAN Foundation for um, supporting this, um, this briefing. And uh, please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>